hardly a day goes past when there isn't a new B-segment SUV crossover being launched into a very crowded market space. In fact, one in five of every new car sold today in Europe is one of these B-segment SUVs. And we've already seen this year alone, so cars such as the BYD Atto 3, Jeep's new Avenger, Fiat 600E, and of course Honda's ENY1 into the market. And of course, there's plenty more still to come. But two of the very original protagonists have come back in very heavily revised or facelifted form to make your decision in this market just that little bit more difficult. So, without further ado, welcome to this week's twin test. Welcome to the all-new Hyundai Kona. Welcome to the heavily revised and facelifted Peugeot E2008. And as always, welcome to Auto EV. <laughs> Now, before we get started on this week's twin test between the new Hyundai Kona and the Peugeot E2008, it is of course that time where I would ask you to make sure you're subscribed to the Auto EV channel. Now, once you've done that, press the little bell button down below because in that way you'll be notified of when our next video is uploaded and goes live. Once you've watched it, if you do enjoy it, make sure you give it a thumbs up and of course don't forget, leave us your comments down below as well. Let me know what your thoughts are on the cars review, such as the new Kona and E2008, and of course on the Auto EV channel as a whole. Now, as I say, these are two of the very kind of original protagonists in this market space and both of them offer a multitude of drivetrains so in other words you can have them in internal combustion engine or as fuel electric vehicles but whereas the Kona is a completely brand new model which we saw in a sneak peek just a few months back Peugeot have just done a big heavily revision on the 2008 but is it enough to remain competitive and is it enough to take the fight from the new Kona but before we start let's take a brief look at each car to get the lowdown so this is the second generation Kona and it follows the same principle as the first in so much that it offers a small compact crossover with a choice of petrol, hybrid or fully electric powertrains. As with the previous car, you can get the electric with a choice of two battery sizes, either a 48 kilowatt hour one giving a WLTP range of up to 234 miles or a larger 65 kilowatt one like this one we have here allowing a potential range of up to 319 miles. The smaller battery comes with a 156 PS motor, the larger one getting a more powerful 218 PS motor. Four trim levels are available with prices ranging from just under £35,000 all the way up to just over £43,000. After being introduced back in 2019, the second generation Peugeot 2008 gained a fully electric model to sit alongside the internal combustion engine versions, with this being more of a facelift rather than a completely new model. Just one battery size is available, a newer 50 kilowatt hour one that should allow a WLTP range of up to 250 miles. Only one motor option is available too with a power output of 158 PS. And like the Kona, four trim levels are available with prices ranging from £36,500 up to just under £42,000. So whilst one is just a heavily facelifted car and one is a brand new car, does that mean is one is necessarily going to be better than the other? And which one should you choose? Well, of course, Hyundai Motor Group have got a huge amount of experience with their electrified vehicles. But Stellantis have been working really, really hard. Of course, Peugeot are part of that Stellantis group, so there's a lot of component sharing with some of the newer offerings that we're seeing, with this new battery that's available in the new E2008 being more efficient and a slightly better motor. So which is going to be best for your cash? Well, of course, the only way we're going to know that is by putting them through the road test that actual car buyers trust when it comes to choosing their next electric vehicle. And that is the Auto EV one. Okay, let's start with the styling. Now, we've done a sneak peek with the Kona before, so it's worthwhile going over again just to sort of talk about what's new and what's different to the old car. Now, we were big fans of the old car, but it wasn't quite perfect. But it, luckily, it's retained its kind of distinctive looks in the marketplace. I mean, it doesn't really look like much else. Now, it's not part of Hyundai's Ionic group because they say it's available with combustion engine plus electrified powertrain as well So it doesn't get the Ionic tag But what it does get is the same styling cues such as the pixel and you'll see them all around the car Even things like the alloy wheels have got the kind of squared off kind of pixelated looks and of course down the front cooling girl Whereas the internal combustion engine car is a different style to the front the electric one gets this pixelated front grill It has this sweeping light bar across the front or as Hyundai call it the seamless horizon lamp yeah and that's pixelated too just across the center section whereas a combustion engine car is seamless right of the way across 
your main lights are obviously down here. Very kind of Kia-like in the way that they've done that. Same with the Nero, the kind of big lamps down the kind of corners down here. That's where your main lamps are. Charging flap remains at the front, which is handy for just pulling into sort of like your, your charging bays. And of course, you get your big, bold Hyundai logo, the revised logo at the top there. And all the cooling, as I say, is done through these kind of pixelated front grille there. So yeah, very distinctive looking car from the front, but it doesn't stop there. Because as you can see, the side profile is very bold too. Lots of creases, lots of angles, very distinctive, very bold. Look at this kind of very sharp crease here. There's another one just below that that runs all the way and then disappears into the door. A bit like the Ionic 5, you've got that kind of slash, that 45 degree kind of slash angle coming down there. And then of course you get that black section here that pinches the bodywork in. Your wheel arches, well, again, you know, they're nice and they stand out in a sense. Well, they don't actually, they kind of go in a little bit here, but do you know what I mean? They've kind of made them part of this big feature. And then this lovely kind of chrome strip that runs up into this big kind of rear boot spoiler here. And then the same at the, at the back, you've got these kind of lamps that are kind of down the side with another LED strip across the back, which you'll see in a second. As I say, you've got your pixels mirrored in the alloy wheels there as well. So that's another sort of like draw into that theme. But yeah. It's a bold looking car, this actually, I think. You're not going to call it pretty, but it's certainly going to stand out. And around the back, it's exactly the same. I'll tell you, there's a couple of bits that I really do like. This kind of, this, the high mounted brake light is just that sort of like small bit there, like a pic, one pixel there. And then it's mirrored by the fog light down there. I quite like that. That's quite cool. And then, as I say, remember, you've got this kind of, another one of these kind of LED strips across the back there. Now, is it just me or does anyone else see Robocop's helmet here? Is that just me? Anyway, a uh, big Hyundai logo, as you can see, and then Kona emblazoned across the back. And of course, you kind of get your pixelated reflectors there, and then these little kind of pixelated bits in the bumpers there. Reversing camera tucked in there, rear wiper, as you'd expect. But yeah, bold, distinctive, very Hyundai. But it's not like the Peugeot's any less conservative. Now, I really like Peugeot's kind of styling direction. When the first little 2008 entered the market space, I think it was way back in 2013 or something like that, it was kind of more of an MPV style of car. And you could see it was related, heavily related to the 208. But then the second generation car that came out in 2019 took on the more kind of SUV style, that kind of compact crossover style that's, that carried on through here. And as I say, it's quite a heavily facelifted car. And I do like what they've done with it. Now you've got the new Peugeot Lion Shield here rather than the kind of line as it was before. So that's new. And of course you get the kind of body coloured grille. Now there's four trim levels available. On the base model one, these are gloss black, but anything above that gets them kind of body coloured. It's a bit difficult to see this on this kind of nice kind of flat grey colour. You get your 2008 logo the nameplate across the front there. And then these are the new lights that they've got here. Whereas before they had the kind of sabre tooth kind of just the singular lamp that went down from here. They've now got the lion claw, as they call it, the three lamps that go down, and these great LED headlamps on the front. Cooling's obviously done down at the bottom, and then obviously you've got your square sensor here for your radar-guided kind of cruise control here. But yeah, it's a bold-looking car, the 2008. I think Peugeot have done a great job facelifting it. Now, inside profile, it's probably the angle that it's least likely to see that it's the facelifted car, but there are some telltale signs. Now, the leading model, the Active, gets steel wheels with wheel trims. Anything above that, the Allure, the GT, which this one is, or the first edition car, gets these nice alloy wheels. And Peugeot have got quite an interesting kind of design going on with their alloys just now. We first saw it on the 408, the new kind of coupe kind of crossed SUV thing, with these kind of really complex shapes on the alloy wheels. And I have to say, I do like those. There's a revised E logo there, which is one of the other ways you can tell that this is obviously the electric version. But you can still see they've got this kind of surfacing work here. It reminds me of the BMW flame surfacing that Chris Bangle brought out. You can kind of see it working with there's different angles to the panels. And again, it just it gives it quite a kind of bold, kind of very assertive look. Um, a little black bit down there, as I say, pinching the bodywork in. You've got two-tone here. You've obviously got your black roof with integrated kind of roof rails on there proper nice big chunky door handles and of course your ubiquitous black wheel arch extensions to make you realise that you are driving a crossover SUV. There's some changes around the back, again new light signature that you've got at the back here and then you lose the prancing, the prancing line from here and you just get the Peugeot script across the back. I love this big chunky bumper that sticks out like a spoiled child's bottom lip, I think that's great and really practical as well. 
obviously integrated kind of roof spoiler there, your high level stop lamp, rear wiper, very much needed in weather like this as well. And then just your nomenclature down there and the little E to tell you it's the E2008 there. So, as I say, two very distinctive looking cars. The Kona, all new, taking on sort of like from where the old one left off and that kind of real kind of different kind of style with the lights being very kind of bold and different. The Peugeot, heavily facelifted, but as I say, I think it's one of Peugeot's better designs. Which one do I prefer? I'm kind of erring on the side of the Peugeot, to be honest with you, but that's not to say I don't love the Kona, because it is a really good looking car, so it could be a bit of a draw. But what do you think? Which one do you prefer? You're the one people that are going to be buying these cars. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comments down below. Now, when it comes to carrying capacity, both are quite evenly matched. The Peugeot has a boot space of 434 litres, but the Kona is slightly bigger at 466 litres. However, that swings round when you fold the rear seats down, with the Peugeot going up to 1,436 litres, with the Kona just being 1,300 litres. That being said, however, the Hyundai does have some storage up at the front, despite the fact that you can have it as an internal combustion engine. They have made better use of the space up front, whereas with the Peugeot, you don't get either. Both have relatively low loading lips, as you can see here, and both have good underfloor storage, with Kona probably being slightly better than the Peugeot. But either way, both are probably ample at carrying a small family's needs. Now, whereas the Peugeot has a 40-60 split rear seat, it's the Hyundai that's probably more practical with that 40-40-20 split, meaning if you're carrying longer items, you can still have two passengers in the back with a load-through facility as well. The other thing where the Hyundai wins a little bit is it has a power boot lid, whereas I've got it, shut the Peugeot's myself. Ah oh well, them's the brakes. So at the front of the Kona, as I say, despite the fact you can have it with an internal combustion engine, Hyundai have managed to put in an extra storage space, much like Kia have done with the Nero. And it's 27 litres just underneath there. And it's not huge, but it would be enough for, I don't know, some extra charging cables or for a very, very small, maybe rucksack or for some muddy walking boots once you've taken your dog for a walk or something. But it is a bit more practical than the Peugeot. Now, when it comes to rear seat space, I'm also going to give the victory to the Kona because it is more spacious. You feel a bit more um, that there's more space in the back here because the Kona has actually grown from the first generation car. Now, despite the fact, as I say, you can also have it with an internal combustion engine, it is a flat floor across, whereas the Peugeot has a transmission tunnel. So you can actually get a third person sitting here in relative comfort. And as I say, remember that... The um, middle section, that 20% section of the rear seat can fold down as well. So if you've got longer loads, you can still have a passenger on either side. The space feels good here. You know, you've got good headroom, despite the fact this car has a sunroof. You sit in a nice, comfortable seat. It's got a good sort of like squab um, to give you good under thigh support. Now, this particular spec of corner we've got is the ultimate one. So this has got quite a high specification on it. Not that the Peugeot doesn't, in fairness, but I've got things like heated rear seats in this particular car as well. You've got USB connectivity down there, USB-C, plus a three-pin plug as well. So if your kids are, you know, or you're sitting here with a laptop, you can plug it in there to take charge off that. And good size face fence. There's a really good view forward as well, because despite the fact you've got these kind of big head restraints, the kind of mesh um, material that they're using on them now. So again, it lets a bit more light through the car. And just there, I suggest the plastics and the trim are a bit lighter to keep it, make it feel a bit more kind of open. And um, storage, yeah, you've got storage in terms of you've got bottle holders on the door. Plus, you've also got the centre armrest, which folds down with two cup holders here as well. And you've also got isofix points, as you can imagine, on um, the outer seats on both. Although they're not sort of like under cover, you've got to kind of jab the prongs of the seat between the backrest and the squab. But certainly in terms of rear accommodation, the Kona is the better of the two cars. But let's have a look at the Peugeot anyway. Now, as I say, don't get me wrong, it's not tight, it's fine. The first thing you need to make sure you do, however, is to put these rear head restraints up, because if you don't, they kind of jab you between the shoulder blades. Now, look, I've still got plenty of leg room. I've still got plenty of foot room. I can get my feet underneath the seats um, without any hassle whatsoever. But it does feel a narrower car. And as I say, remember, you've got this raised transmission tunnel here. So a third person in the middle here 
is going to find that a little bit uncomfortable. The downside with the 2008, however, is like the Jeep Avenger um, that we featured a few uh, weeks back, there's not an awful lot of storage. You've got matte pockets on the backs of the seats and you've got a door bin that's quite shallow here, but there's no centre armrest, so there's no extra cup holders here. That's a downside. Plus as well, there's no face fence in the back, so the airflow you're relying on coming through from the front. There's two USB, um, USB ports there, a USB-A and a USB-C. I just had to look there. Um, so you do have connectivity, but as I say, that's about it. You know, that's where the Kona really does win. No sort of like rear heating on the seats, even on this top, you know, top spec GT model. Um, that's it, really. Um, your Isofix points, the same as all the other Stellantis offerings, you've got to unzip this first. Oh, God, which is an absolute pain in the watsits. And then you can get to the, your prongs through in there. So, again, it's not an ideal solution either. So, yeah. Without doubt, the Kona is the better of the two when it comes to rear accommodation. Now, whilst again, like the exterior styling, this the um, you can see the sort of like the the family resemblance to the Ionic models from Hyundai because obviously you've got this kind of very kind of wrap around style with the two 12.3 inch displays like you get in Ionic 5 and Ionic 6. And again, the pixel theme plays into the cabin as well because instead of the H logo on the middle of the steering wheel, you get the four pixels four dots letter h in morse code so there you go it's a really interesting cabin this it's probably believe it or not the most conventional of the two cars and you'll see that when we jump in the Peugeot but let me just quickly go through what we're, we're faced with here so obviously you've got your big infotainment screen here and um, which has got your satellite navigation uh, apple carplay and android auto as you would expect but when you go into sort of like the home screen here of course you've got this touch screen you swipe across to get your different tiles and um, to get your various different things so you want your phone um, your phone projection your weather your radio or your navigation which you can just click on there or as more likely you can use these physical buttons here now this is quite good on both of the cars in fairness have a reasonable amount of physical buttons but I think it's the Hyundai that does it slightly better because all the things that you might need at a quick kind of glance or as you're driving is on a physical button you don't have to go into the screen to alter things so your climate control is all done by physical buttons here um, your drive modes like the Peugeot you've got a physical button there but things around it such as the heating heated seat the ventilated seat because this is the ultimate model that's on a physical button and then you've got a lot more up here as well actually on the steering wheel which is a really nice wheel this nice kind of three spoke kind of steering wheel almost kind of reminds me of kind of so, you know the 70s Japanese kind of sports car wheels I do like that so yes yeah, so there's a lot more kind of buttons in here just to get things at a, a, a quick reach you know it's a volume for your radio you're tuning for your radio I mean obviously you can still use the screen if you want to move things around that's fine but if you want something just quickly like your track search um, for your media or your radio or to go straight to the media you just press a button there and that brings that up rather than the navigation if you want navigation just press map and it comes up immediately so it's a really really nice easy cabin to get on with there's a lot of space as well here you get a wireless charging pad in the, uh, in the center but here you get two cup holders here as you can see or you can fold them away completely um, and just have one big kind of storage bin you know for things like sunglasses and such like plus there's more storage back here in this big bin with this kind of lidded box as a cover here um just put these back there we go um you got connectivity here for your usb ports as well there and a 12 volt socket in there one thing i've noticed with this that's very different to the ionic models and i'm a real critic of it is the positioning of the speedo and the range the dials effectively because whenever i've been in an ionic when i'm driving it it feels like the speed the speedo has been cut off by the rim of the wheel and there's a lot of space, real estate, in the middle of the screen for really not a lot of information. It's completely different in the corner. So actually, they've kind of moved those inboard almost, so that it doesn't cut the speed off at all. It's really good. You can really get a nice uh, view of your speedo, and then your range, obviously, on this side, and then your trip meter in the middle. I mean, there's a various amount of configuration you can have in some respects, 
because what you can do is you can have different sort of like things in the middle here, whether it's your trip meter, whether it's the navigation um, or media playing or your lane keep assist and such like that displays there. And then you've just got a nice simple sort of like font for your speedo there and then your range there. Ultimate model also gets a head up display as well. So that's good. That's nice and easy to, to read as well. But the dashboard, as I say, when you're driving in this conventional kind of driving position, is really nice and clear and very, very easy to see and, and easy to use. Your transmission level is on this big stock here, like the Onyx 5. So that's got a rotatable sort of like end to it, whether you want to be able to drive, um, you turn it forward, reverse, all the way back, and park is at the end, just a button at the end. The only thing I will say, so whilst it is so well built in here, I mean, there's not a squeak or a rattle as you would expect it from, the use of the materials, some of them aren't quite so... I mean, some of them are okay. There's this kind of rubberized kind of plastic at the top here, but then you've got sort of like harsher plastics around there, and then you've got the kind of soft vinyl on the door. I like the seat materials, this micro suede, they call it, which is nice, and then with the kind of leather on the outer, which is nice, and the head restraints are really nice as well. This netting that just kind of nestles the back of your head. But it feels very grey and it feels very plasticky. Now Hyundai have got a huge sustainability message. So a lot of this is recycled plastics as you would expect. But it really does look it. That's the only thing I will um, I will say about it. You, you can't get away from the fact that it, it, it looks plasticky and it's very grey. As I say, it's not, it's not a, a fault of the build quality, which is brilliant. It's just the look and the sort of like the texture of it. It doesn't feel maybe as premium as the Peugeot does, believe it or not. As I say, good storage. As you've seen these bits here, you've got three door bins. There's a little shelf there, but again, it's just a kind of a ribbed plastic. Things will slide around on that. And then you've just got a conventional glove box. I'd quite like to have seen the kind of drawer like you get in the Ionic models, but that's just me. But yeah, it's a usable glove box nonetheless. The driving position is good. And there's a good range of adjustment. And this car's got electric seats, um, which you get uh, for a driver and passenger. Um, however, the seat feels a little bit short in the squab. Now, I'm not a particularly tall man. I'm only five foot eight. So, uh, you know, if you're six foot, you might have long legs. You might find there's just a bit lacking in the kind of under thigh support on the seat. But the driving position itself is very good. You know, you see you get a nice clear view of the screen. Uh, sort of the, wind, uh, the windscreen, you get a nice clear view of the dashboard. Everything falls nice and easily to hand. Nice steering wheel and a good use of controls. But as I say, it's the, the amount of physical buttons and the way that they're just positioned so um, conveniently that if you need to get something really quickly, it's a good design of interior, this. It is. Now, whilst the cone is probably the more unique looking on the outside, it's the Peugeot. It certainly has the style on the inside. Now, I really do like this sort of like style that Persia have got going on with this eye cockpit, as they call it. It's not going to be everyone's cup of tea. That's the only thing I will say, but I, I don't mind it. And I love the, sort of like the style of it. I love the look of what Persia have done with the interior. And as I say, the materials they've used does make it feel a tiny bit more premium than the Kona, believe it or not. Right, let's start with what we've got. So, Facelifted car, they all now get this 10-inch um, infotainment display. The old car on the base model, I think it was a 7-inch one, but they all now get this 10-inch display. You can have a further option, I think, on GT, uh, Allure and GT, with this 3D instrumentation cluster, which I think looks phenomenal. I love looking down through this. Now, let me just talk about that whilst I'm, I'm on the subject. So the driving position is very unconventional. So what you have is a very small steering wheel and it almost sits in your lap and you look over the top of it into this cockpit, um, this dis driver display. So you don't have a head-up display because effectively that's what that is there. It's very clear, very easy to read, but it looks phenomenal. I love the way that it looks. As I say, all 3D and everything's kind of layered, if you like, all the information is there. So I do like that. That's the one thing that, that really appeals to me. Plus as well, your infotainment screen here, whilst obviously it's a separate screen, again, it's again in the same line of sight, a bit like the Hyundai, you've got a nice clear view across of everything you're going to need to use. Okay, so that's the first thing, but as I say, that takes a lot of getting used to, especially the small steering wheel. Great on a little 208 where you can really chuck it around 
as you kind of get into the bigger cars, it does take a bit getting more used to. And it's a kind of a kind of kind of oval kind of almost quarterish kind of shape, and um, with just the two spokes, with just enough controls on it for your radio and such like that you need to use there. If you want the cruise control, that's on a separate column stock, which is down here. Okay, the materials love it. This kind of almost kind of rubber carbon fibre that kind of stretches across this kind of lower bit of the dash and then this upper kind of leatherette style here with a nice kind of stitch on this GT model and this ambient lighting that goes around. The only thing is there's a, a heavy prodigious use of piano black, this glossy black plastic which as you know just attracts fingerprints and dust. That's the only thing but it's, it's a nice looking interior this but it does take a bit of getting used to. The seats, now this, these are optional, they, well in terms of the material on the GT line, this is an option on the car. So you've got this kind of Alcantara middle bit here, the kind of leatherette on the side with a contrast stitch. But they feel a little bit better than the, the Konas in terms of they're a little bit longer in the squab. They've got a bit more support down kind of the side of your lateral support and certainly on the shoulders as well. So yeah, it's a, it's a good seat. But as I say, the driving position is a little bit more unconventional. Right, let me move on, because it's not all perfect. Now, unlike the Kona, whilst there are still some physical buttons, these kind of piano key buttons here, they're, they're not all there. There's still some touch-sensitive stuff here. So your heated seat button is just up in here, of passenger, and then obviously your driver's side, and they're touch-sensitive with no haptic feedback. If you want to go to the home screen, you press the top one there, and that takes you back to the home screen, or your car settings is that one there where you press it, and it brings up these. Now the screen itself is good, it's, it's nice and it's clear, and you get little kind of clicks when you press it, which is nice, but you have to go into it to use an awful lot of it. So for instance, um, you know, your, your quick deactivation, your lane keep assist, driver attention alert, whilst that's done on a button on the Hyundai, you've got to go into the screen on the Peugeot. Um, Climate control, yes, obviously it does have it, but whilst again, it's physical buttons on the Hyundai, it's in the screen in the Peugeot. Good graphics, you know, it's nice, and I say you do get the bit of haptic feedback, but again, it's another layer away, whereas the Hyundai, it's just a click of a button. It's a two-stage process that you get in the Peugeot. That's all, that's all I would go on about it. The navigation system itself is all right. It's done by TomTom, Tom, and obviously, as I say, you've got Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, as you'd expect. Um, as well, which obviously has to be plugged in. Storage is good. You've got this little flap that opens here. There's a wireless charging pad in there, depending on the model, and you can also use that as a phone holder as well. Um, you've got this little bin in here, which is probably enough for your kind of sunglasses. You've got two um, conventional kind of bottle cup holders here. You've got the driver, uh, sorry, the transmission toggle switch here, just a nice little heel pad to, to rest your arm on electric parking brake and then your drive mode buttons there. So not quite as much storage space. You've got a little kind of bin in there which is fairly deep in fairness and some decent sized door bins but there's not quite the same amount of storage in the Peugeot than you get in the Kona. So as I say it's it's a little bit of a kind of even Stevens. I like the usability of the Kona for the physical buttons and as I say you can just jump in it and data suggests it's a much more conventional um, interior to use. This takes a little bit of getting used to, and until you use it, some people will love it, others might not so much. But there's just, again, there's just a little bit too much you need to delve into that screen to get to things, such as your climate control, whereas the Hyundai has it on physical buttons. But then the counter with the Peugeot is, I like the materials that they've used in here. As I say, it feels quite special. It feels a bit more premium um, than the Hyundai does. So I think in terms of front cockpit, you could possibly call it a draw but that's obviously going to be down to you guys. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Now, in terms of usability, it is the corner that has the advantage here because this one is a 65 kilowatt hour battery, meaning that it has a potential range, according to WLTP cycle, of up to 319 miles. However, you can have it with a more Peugeot compatible 48 kilowatt hour battery in the lead-in advanced model that's coming out, which is probably a little bit more of a comparison with the battery in the Peugeot which we'll come on to in just a second. However, when we talk about pricing, whilst this is a top of the range model I have here, you can have this big battery in a slightly lower down trim level, which would bring it price parity with the Peugeot. So again, it is the Kona that has the advantage when it comes to range. 
However, charging speeds, well, that's a bit disappointing because it's not based on the eGMP platform of the Ionic models. And I say you can have it with an internal combustion engine. It doesn't quite get that 800 volt architecture that you get with those cars. And because of that, a 10 to 80% charge in the Kona takes 41 minutes. Now, Hyundai say that the charging curve is up, it stays at that kind of peak rate for a little bit longer, but even so, 41 minutes is a little bit disappointing when a lot of the class can do the same benchmark in the usual sort of like 30 minutes. Now, the Peugeot. This is a 50 kilowatt hour battery, and it's a new battery. We've seen it in the Jeep Avenger, and we're going to see it in the Fiat 600e as well. Now, whilst that's not as big as this car, it does, I mean, a slight, they've tuned it a little bit more and they're slightly more efficient, but a WLTP range of 250 miles is still lagging behind the 319 miles of the Kona. However, the charging speeds, again, 100 kilowatts, but the 10 to 80% benchmark is done in the Peugeot in the usual half an hour. Now, charging both cars up from your seven kilowatt wall box, you're gonna be looking at around about, just about 10 and a half hours for the Kona, and probably just about eight hours for the Peugeot. The Kona, however, comes with an 11 kilowatt uh, onboard charger as standard, as well as a heat pump. You can have the um, 11 kilowatt charger on the Peugeot, but that's an option, but there's no heat pump available on the car. All right, let's start with the Kona. Um, the newest car, in terms of the fact that it's all new, um, it replaces the Model M before, which is a car we've always liked on Auto EV. In fact, it won our kind of family car uh, triple test last year when it went up against the, the Peugeot Rifter and the um, Citroen EC4. But as I say, it was, wasn't a perfect car. Um, I questioned a little bit some of its refinement at times. I always found it to be, you know, it just never seemed to be quite as quiet as its cousin from Kia, the Nero. There seemed to be an awful lot more road noise uh, from the corner. I'm pleased to say that's one area that has vastly improved with the new one. This is a really quiet car, it's very refined. We'll talk about that in a little second though. What are we looking at in terms of power? Well, because this is the bigger battery, um, it's the uh, it's the 65 kilowatt hour battery which gets the more powerful motor, which is just over 200 PS uh, power delivery, which gives you a 0 to 60 time around about 7.8 seconds. So again, pretty much on par where you would expect a small compact crossover with 200 brake horsepower, give or take, to be around thereabouts. As I say, you can have the car with a smaller battery and also uh, a less powerful motor, which is probably more comparable in terms of the Peugeot. Um, but as I say, if you look at the price, depending on the spec that you go for in the Kona, this actually is one that you can actually get for the same price as the Peugeot, if that all makes sense. Right. Okay, so how does it drive? Well, as I say, the biggest improvement you notice is the refinement. The road noise is really well suppressed. The old car seemed to have a kind of, I always felt there was a kind of wind resonance, if you like, going through the wheel arches, um, which was quite noticeable. Um, no matter what the surface, but certainly at higher speed, you could really tell that there was um, a noticeable amount of noise coming from the road surface. That is no longer the case in this new car, so they've worked hard to get the refinement right on it. Um, one area where the old car did perform well was how easy it was to, to live with and how easy it was to drive. There's a sort of slickness to the controls um, that you get with Hyundai and Kia. Uh, and it's exactly the same um, here in this new Kona. It's a very, very easy car to kind of get on with. There's a nice balance of um, balance of weight, if that makes sense, in the controls. So when you move from the throttle to the brake, it's the pedals feel very, you know, feel very much the same. They've got the same amount of kind of linear kind of pressure that's applied to them, if that makes sense. So when you put your foot down on the accelerator, it's not neck snappingly sharp like you saw getting some EVs, and then the brake requires a really heavy push. They've got the weighting of the pedals just right, in my opinion. I think it's a really nice, easy kind of car just to move from the uh, the pedal, the accelerator pedal to the brake pedal, and it feels like you're driving the same car which is not often the case with some EVs. Let's talk about the brakes because as we've come to expect with Hyundai and Kia, the brake regeneration is one of the best um, that you can get out there. It's very adaptable and it's, it's easy to sort of like change it as to how you want. So for instance, if you want to sort of like, um, you know, take off the, 
the re sorry ramp up the regen you just pull back on this left hand paddle which increases the amount of regen and then on your right hand one takes it all off there's a further setting where you can go um, to oh, hang on sorry I'll talk about that beeping in a second there's a further level you can go to where if you pull and hold the right paddle it goes into an automatic setting where the car will use its front radar guided cruise control to know if there's a car in front that's slowing down quicker and will apply regen uh, more aggressively than if there wasn't a car there I think this is one of the best systems out there, if not the best system out there in terms of regen. You can go from everything from having no regen at all to having one pedal driving. Um, so there's something for everyone in there. Now, let's talk about that beeping noise because, like, again, we've come to expect with all of these cars, there's now a massive amount of safety systems fitted to them as standard. The Hyundai's probably got a little bit better in terms of what standard equipment than the Peugeot has but it is if you're an old fuddy-duddy like me a little bit annoying at times because um, there's two things which this car has now that the old one didn't have you've got your speed limit warning which you can take up see as soon as you go above one mile an hour above the speed limit it pings at you now most new cars are getting this and I find that annoying because I think as a driver you should be aware of your speed you know, if you're speeding, you should be held responsible for that. The car shouldn't be reminding you. You should know what you're doing. The second one is there's now a driver alert um, thing here now. So there's a little kind of camera sensor on top of the steering column. If I take my eyes off the road too much to talk to you as the camera, or if I block it, if you're somebody that holds their hand maybe at the 12 o'clock, it will come up and warn you that it can't see your face and it doesn't think you're paying attention. See, that's that speed limit warning. I'm in a 50 and I'm doing 52 miles an hour and it's just telling me that. As I say, you can turn it off. The downside is when you switch the car back on again, it all defaults back on. So it's not something you can permanently disable. You've got to do it every time you drive the car. That's the thing I find annoying with it. Not the fact that it has it, the fact that you've, if you don't want it, you've got to physically go into the screen and change it every time. So, that's one of the kind of downsides and say if you're an old fuddy-duddy like me. Steering, very good. Uh, as I say, there's a kind of nice oily slickness to the controls and that applies to the steering as well. Um, you know, as you turn the wheel, as I say, it feels really nice. Um, there's a nice weight behind it, it feels just right. Um, the suspension is one area where I think the Peugeot's better than the Kona in terms of its drive. There's a firmness to the ride of the Kona. Not uncomfortable, it's just you can feel the road surface a bit more through um, through the chassis of the Kona. Whereas on the Peugeot, the Peugeot tends to sort of like um, suppress, um, sort of like, you know, sort of like the undulation's a bit better. It's got a slightly softer setup and it feels just slightly better in my opinion. Kona also gets this really good blind spot monitoring that we've come to expect from Hyundai and Kia. The one where you flick the indicator on and you get the image down the side of the car, the one that Tesla's now using as well. I think that's one of the best safety systems that a manufacturer are doing. Sorry, I'm just eking above 30 there. Um, and I think that's a great system. I really like it. And as I say, it's a nice, especially if you drive in town a lot and you've got kind of couriers on bikes and things coming up alongside you it really does help alleviate any of that, that kind of blind spot you get. As I say, the suspension's nice, it, it, it's firm, the handling's good, there's a nice turning, um, there's a nice balance to the chassis, um, but as I say, the trade-off is you do notice the ride quality being a little bit more firm. You can tell if there's more imperfections in the road surface if you're driving the Hyundai rather than the Peugeot. So it doesn't quite kind of cause it you as much as the Peugeot does. And you could probably see the camera shake a little bit more in the Hyundai than you will in the, the Peugeot. The flip side is this is slightly better body control. So maybe if you're a more enthusiastic driver, then maybe the Hyundai is probably the one that you're going to enjoy a little bit more. Um, we'll talk about the Peugeot when we're driving it. But other than that, there's not a huge amount to sort of like really um, put you off the Hyundai. Um, it does everything really very well. The only thing I will say, the nice driving position, the only thing I will say, and I, I said it before, I'm, I'm, I must admit, I find the seat a little bit short on the squab. 
and I'm not a particularly tall man as you know so I think if you were over six foot that's one area that you might just find that's just a little bit disappointing with the Hyundai as I say it just feels that I don't know it's just a little bit short shorter than I would expect it to be um, there's different driving modes as you would come to expect and they're activated via this drive mode selector down here like I was saying when we were doing the interior I like the fact that everything's via a button and it's really easy to reach from the driving seat you know so if you need to change something whether it's your temperature whether it's your radio station whether it's your driving mode it's a button you don't have to keep going into the screen I think Hyundai have judged this really well in my opinion uh, driving modes right so you get your usual suspects of eco normal and sport but there's a fourth one as well snow um, where obviously if you're driving the car on a slightly sort of like data suggest slippier surface it will moderate the torque delivery a little bit better to allow a little bit more traction still single motor it's not all-wheel drive um, but as I say at least you get that sort of like moderation of torque to allow you to use the throttle a little bit more prodigiously to get going in snow as well so that's the fourth kind of driving mode that they've added into it there other than that I think what you find with the new Kona is a real improvement. I really like the old car. The old car, we always said, was was quite an, you know, certainly quite a decent steer. They've improved that with this new one, but they've made it more refined. And that was the one area that I really felt that the old one was just lacking in. As I say, if you if you judged it against the the Kia Nero, you would always find the Kia was the nicer car in terms of sort of you know longer distance driving, a bit more refined, a little bit more noise suppression you were isolated from the outside world a bit better in the, in the Kia and um, Hyundai have upped the game with the Kona and I think now that what you find is it's still not quite as good as the new Nero but it's an awful lot better than the old Kona was and I think it's a really marked improvement this is a really impressive little car to drive now jumping into the Peugeot um, as I say as well as this new battery this new more efficient uh, battery there's also a new motor as well so whereas the previous car had to make do with just 136 ps it was this one's now up to 154 ps it doesn't make a massive difference um to the car i mean not to 60 comes down from i think it's 9.9 .9 seconds to 9.1 so it still trails the corner but not by as much as maybe it used to do and now there is only the one battery and one motor option available in the 2008 and as I've said, it's sort of shared across the Stellantis group. So it's the same one that appears in the DS3 um, e tense It's the same one that appears in the Jeep Avenger. It's the same one that's going into the, the Fiat 600e. And, of course, Corsa and, um, and uh, the Mocha e as well. So as I say, it's got to kind of share itself across all of those brands. But as we've found um, with sort of like cars that share engineering componentry, certainly even in the EV world they can be engineered to feel very very different so don't think that the Peugeot E 2008 is just like the Jeep Avenger is just like the Vauxhall Mocha is just like the DS3 it's not it does feel a different wee car and it's a very good little car I really like this now the first thing to discuss is this driving position this driving environment if you like so as I say you sit behind a wheel that is very very small and it tends to sit in your lap and you look over the top into sort of like this binnacle this cowling uh, dashboard if you like so you don't really get a head-up display in the 2008 because you've kind of already got it by having the binnacle mounted as high as, you, as, as it is now not everyone is going to get on with this I don't mind it I genuinely don't mind it but I do appreciate it might not be everyone's cup of chai latte it's, it's, it does take a bit of getting used to, especially this very, very small steering wheel. And it's very noticeable once you jump from one car into the other, how different it feels in terms of that. On the little E208, as I've said before, you know, a little small hatchback, you're maybe kind of chucking it around the little roads. It feels quite nice and darty. And a slightly bigger car, like a small crossover, it does take you a little bit by surprise. Your inputs just have to be a little bit more varied rather than just being a bit overzealous with your steering input but once you get used to it honestly it's absolutely fine i do like the view you get into this binnacle as i've said before i like the instrumentation now not all 2008s get this 
the base model active has conventional dials. You've got to move up the range before you get these kind of 3D eye cockpit ones. But I would urge you to do it because they look sensational and they're really clear. You know, you think, oh, that sounds a bit complex and it sounds a little bit too much to look at. Actually, it's not. It's a very simple layout and it's really easy to read, especially when you're on the move. Now, you can configure it. There is a, a, you know, a small amount of configuration available. You can put sort of like navigation up in here. So if you're using it, you can have your nav um, sorted in there as, as well as it. And as I say, it's all layered. It, it just looks cool. I don't know how to describe it. It's a great um, little set of, sort of like dials. It really is. I love it. Um, and then as you say, you've got this nice kind of vista across into the, sort of like the infotainment screen as well. The driving position, once you've kind of got over this wheel in your lap scenario, is quite good. The seats feel like they've got a bit of a longer squab than they do in the corner, and they've certainly got a lot more support in this GT uh, specification car. So you've got much more lateral support, more shoulder support. They just feel like they're probably that little bit more better uh, for a longer drive. Now, when you option up, the optional material that's on this one it also comes with electric adjustment on the driver's seat plus a massage function as well so you do get quite a bit for your money in terms of optioning that up um the i talked about the ride quality um being better in the persian as in a cone and it really is um it's certainly set up to be a much more supple car again even in this gt trim spec you don't tend to sort of like feel um, the expansion joints, the drain hole covers as fiercely as you do in the Kona. Not that I say the Kona was an uncomfortable car, it's not. It's just the Peugeot is more comfortable. It's not as comfortable as a Citroen EC4. It's somewhere in between the two cars. But it's certainly a really noticeable difference between the two with the Peugeot being the better one for comfort. The trade-off with that, however, is there's a bit more body roll in the car. It does feel a little bit more top heavy as well. You get a little bit more roll in the corners. So if you are getting a bit of a shuffle on, it's the corner that feels the sportier of the two. And you feel like you can, uh, the 2008 would run out of talent quicker than the corner, if that makes sense. So you just have to decide what's going to be best for you. But in terms of ride comfort, for me, it's the Peugeot that, that wins on that contest. When you put your foot down in the normal mode, it's fine. It gathers speed quite well. It's not quite as accelerative as the Kona, as you'd expect, because obviously it doesn't have the power of the Kona. And remember, of course, with the Stellantis Group cars, you only get the full power delivery when you flick it into the sport mode. Now, the usual suspects are here. You've got your Eco, um, your Normal, and then Sport. When you put your foot down in sport mode, yeah, there is, there, is an, there is a difference, but it's not night and day of a difference. It doesn't feel massively quicker when you put it into the sport mode. The throttle has still got a decent amount to travel on it before you still really start to kind of pick up speed. It's the corner that feels the much sportier of the two. Um, brake regeneration. Now, this is the typical kind of Stellantis uh, brake regen system that you have on the car. In other words, it's either on or it's off, and it's not one pedal driving. So if that's your kind of bag, if you really enjoy that kind of one pedal driving that you get with some EVs, you're going to be a bit disappointed with the 2008 because you don't have it. Basically, it's either off at the moment, or as I say, if we flick the little button into B, um, then it'll just you can just feel the car just start to slow up, but it'll slow the car down to a creep. It won't pull it up to an absolute stop. So just be aware of that as well. I don't really mind it. I must admit, the cone is better because it does allow you that sort of like um, adjustability um, to suit, depending obviously what you prefer and what your needs are. Otherwise, the brake feel itself is an improvement on the old car. Now, they've not changed a huge amount mechanically in the car in terms of the chassis and the suspension, but just of late, and whether or not they've done something and not really shouted about it, I always found the Stellantis cars, their brakes, they were really wooden and feel. So when you first go on the pedal, there was nothing would happen, nothing would happen, and then it would grab all of a sudden. These are better. There is a much more kind of progressive feel to the pedal on these and I think what it was before was the transition between sort of like regen and, and, and then the, the friction brakes 
it, they, they couldn't blend it particularly well and I think maybe they've now got a bit of did I suggest had a bit of practice at it and they're doing really well at it gosh that's a strong sun um, and they've you know they've, they've managed to sort it out because they say you do feel now that there is a bit more of a kind of linear feel to the brake pedal which I'm really pleased about uh, see, I first noticed it in the little Jeep Avenger, and I see you can kind of feel it here as well. So, kudos to you, Peugeot, if you've changed that. You've you've done a decent job. Other than that, it's a really nice little car. It's pretty much the same as was before. There are some safety systems. You don't get as many as you do on the corner. Certainly not as standard. Um, but obviously, you do get sort of like your usual amount that you would anticipate. You don't have those inferno. Oh, sorry, that's that width restriction. You don't have those infernal um, beeps and bongs, you know, if you go slightly above the speed limit. You've got a speed limit warning on the dashboard, but it's not beeping and bonging at me all the time, which is quite nice as well. There is a lack, as I said before, of kind of physical buttons in the, the Peugeot. Um, so for changing... Um, you know things at a, a, you know quickly it takes a bit more thought you've got to go into the screen a little bit more depending obviously on what you want to use so for instance if you just want to nudge your temperature down a little bit you've got to you've got to use the screen there but you can act, you, you've got these little shortcut piano keys here which means you can sort of like access it quite quickly you know to go through a too many menus so you press the, you know the air conditioning one the climate control one and immediately it comes up on the screen and then you adjust it but it's just that two-stage process where on the corner you've got the button that knocks it down the only other thing that i am not disappointed with it's you know because everyone's a slightly different the driving position itself whilst i like this kind of small wheel and the kind of over the the, the, the wheel look into the binnacle and the seat it feels a bit tighter for my left leg here where i position the transmission tunnel feels a bit tighter in the Peugeot than it does in the corner and it's noticeable now as you know, I'm not a tall man. I don't have big feet, so it's it, it, it's not that. It's not me. You do notice that your leg, although there is a footrest, there is my leg is pressed up against the transmission tunnel, up against this console, whereas it's not in the Hyundai. Um, so yeah, just watch that. If you are taller than me, which let's be honest, probably everyone's going to be. Um, if you are taller than me, just watch that because my knee, as I say, it's just at that point where the, the console starts to rise and I'm just conscious of it being pressed against that. Other than that, there's not really an awful lot to complain about in here. This is a nice little car. It was before and it's retained that pleasantness, if you like. Peugeot have worked relatively hard on areas um, that needed addressing maybe, like the brakes. As I say, there's elements of it that are much better than the corner, as I say, the ride comfort I think is is, is better. The seats are better, um, and whilst it does lack the performance of the corner, it's not bad for this style of car. And if it is just a small family crossover you're after, I can't really see you needing much more power than this. Maybe a little bit more would be nice, and the fact that you wouldn't have to be in the sport mode to get that full power would be something I would maybe suggest that that, that is something an, an area that I would um, prefer but it's not bad at all and as I say it still remains I think one of the better cars in this class and I think it's I don't think this is quite as nice to drive as the Jeep Avenger because I really do like that wee Jeep but maybe in terms of the Vauxhall Mocha uh, maybe in terms of some other cars in the class it certainly has moved up a rung or two this is a good little car from Peugeot. I like it. Now, when it comes to pricing, it is the corner that is the more expensive of the two. And this particular model we've got, as I say, is the ultimate trim, and it has a couple of options, the Lux Pack and the Metallic Paint, which brings the price of this particular test car to £45,160. However, without those options, you can knock £2,000 off that price to be just over £43,000. But remember, you can get it in lower trim. In fact, there's going to be an inline model, which is probably a little bit more like the GT trim level of the Peugeot. We're still with the bigger battery, however, so in terms of price parity, they're a bit more evenly matched than you might imagine from these two cars. The Peugeot, however, in GT trim, as it sits here, is just over 40,000 pounds, so a little bit more than the old model was. 
But bear in mind, as I say, whilst you're thinking that £5,000 of a difference, you get the heat pump as standard in the corner, you get the 11 kilowatt um, char onboard charger as standard, and of course, it comes with a five year warranty as opposed to the Peugeot's three year warranty. And in terms of its efficiency and its range, you're getting a much more out of the corner than you are on the Peugeot. So it's not quite the big gulf that you might think that it is. Now, when it comes to competition, like I said, this is a huge market space. There is plenty out there, depending obviously on your wants and needs. And we've seen more cars come onto the marketplace this year alone, with plenty still to come. So where do we start? Well, of course, if you look at Hyundai Group, then of course you've got Kia within that. And of course there's the Nero um, EV, one of our favorite um, small EVs that's out there. That's gonna be a competitor even in this market space with its own kind of cousin. Stellantis Group, of course, Peugeot's part of the big umbrella uh, brand of Stellantis. So Vauxhall, Mocha, DS Automobiles, the DS3, Jeep, the Avenger, Fiat, the 600E that's coming out. And then of course we talk about the new Chinese manufacturers that have come on the scene this year. This year, BYD with the Ato 3, MG still there with the still fabulous ZS EV. Don't forget about that car, because that's still a really comparable car to these two and does offer you know, a good warranty, good range with a choice of batteries at less money than both of these cars. We've also seen new offerings from Geely, um, which are now um, who take a partnership in uh, Smart. Uh, with Mercedes-Benz, of course, there's the new Smart Hashtag 1 that's at this price point as well. And of course, its cousin that's coming next year, the Volvo EX30. Another big player that's going to enter the market space soon is Ford, because the next car that they're going to electrify is the Puma. And the Puma is one of the best-selling uh, small SUVs you can get. And when that goes electric, that's going to provide serious competition in this market space. So here's what we like and what we don't like about the new Hyundai Kona. What we like is distinctive styling. There's a choice of batteries. It offers good range and efficiency. It's good performance. We can see an improved refinement from the previous Kona. And of course, there's Hyundai's excellent warranty package. What we don't like, well, it is getting a little bit expensive. Some of those interior plastics do let the side down a little bit. And we also feel that its charging speed and charging benchmark times are a little bit disappointing against other competitors in the market. And here's what we like and what we don't like about the newly facelifted Peugeot E 2008. Well, we like its styling, the interior design, it drives well, the ride quality, and there's a good choice of trim levels available. We don't like, well, there is just the one battery size available the lack of storage for rear seat passengers and the range, whilst better than before, can't quite match the Hyundai at this price point. Both of these cars show a noticeable improvement over the previous namesakes and whilst the Peugeot is just a facelift, you can see all the little differences that Peugeot have done to the car and it remains competitive, as I've said, in a really busting marketplace. It still remains a real standout car, especially even within the umbrella brand of Stellantis. Given the fact how many cars share the underpinnings of this car, you can really say what Peugeot have done with this is enough to keep it absolutely at the top of its game. However, the victory for us has to go to the corner. Yes, it is a little bit more expensive than this particular Peugeot and this guy's, but remember, as I say, if you knock it down a trim level, that price parity comes in line with the Peugeot. And of course, you get the bigger battery, you get the better range and the better efficiency that you've come to expect from Hyundai. Plus as well, you get much more standard equipment on the vehicle and you get that better warranty. So in terms of this twin test, the spoils do go to the Hyundai Kona. But don't take that as saying that the Peugeot is a bad car, because as I say, it still remains one of our favourite small B-segment SUV crossovers. And like we've said, there's plenty to choose from. Thank you for watching yet another episode of Auto EV. As always, please make sure that you are subscribed to the channel. And then once you've done that, press the bell button that's down below, because then that way you'll be notified when our next video is live and is uploaded. If you have enjoyed the video, make sure you give it a thumbs up and don't forget, leave us your comments down below. What do you think of these two cars? Would you have chosen the Peugeot over the Hyundai? Do you own one of these? Have you got one on order? Of course, as always, let me know your thoughts down below. Now, remember, we're across all social media platforms as well. So Facebook, X, LinkedIn, Instagram, 
So please give us a follow there as well because every little bit helps. Oh, we're even on TikTok now as well, so there you go. And if you're just desperate to hear more reviews from the electric car world, then stick on our YouTube channel because there's well over 160 videos for your viewing pleasure. All that remains for me to say is thank you once again for watching. Thank you for continuing to support the channel. And I'll see you again soon.